Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, episode 35, Ponga and Puhihuia. There was continual warfare between the Tainui people on Maunga Fo, Mount Eden, and those who lived at Afitu on the Manako Harbour. The people of Afitu maintained that the shark fishing grounds at Puponga was theirs, but those of Maunga Fo claimed the favoured spot for themselves. This led to warfare and many people were killed, but because they were all of Tainui, some of the elders were concerned and they made peace with each other. Until someone went fishing, and then the trouble started all over again. During a time of peace, the people of Maunga Fo went to visit their friends at Afitu. Among them was a beautiful girl whose name was Puhihuia, while among the lesser chiefs of Afitu was a young warrior named Ponga. He fell in love with Puhihuia as soon as he saw her, but he was not the only one among the young chiefs who noticed the beautiful girl of Maunga Fo. Some time afterwards, the people of Afitu visited their relatives at Maunga Fo. The young men prepared presents for the girls, gathering the ripe fruit of the meadow to make sweet oil and herbs and grasses for scent. Most of them had brothers and sisters to help them, but Ponga was an only son. He asked his mother how to procure the scented oil, and she and her friends made some for him. At last the day came when the young men of Afitu were able to visit Maunga Fo and take part in the huckers and the games. There were many people on the marae, and the dancers stood ready in their ranks. First came the steady stamping of the young men of Maunga Fo. Puhihuia was looking on, ready to take her part. At the right moment, she dashed forward with glaring eyes and protruding tongue, contorting her face and body in dance that welcomed the visitors. Ponga's heart almost suffocated him with his rapid beating as he watched her, but he said nothing to his friends, all of whom were overcome with admiration for the girl. When the people of Afitu danced their haka, Ponga was the leader. When the dancing was over, Ponga went back with the other young men to the guest house. He could not sleep, however. After turning restlessly from side to side, he went outside, followed by his slave, who sat with him in the darkness. Perhaps you are weary. You must have overexerted yourself in the haka, the slave said. Hearing fishes sleep while eel fishes rise up. This is not my own home, Ponga replied. I am thinking of other things. The slave drew closer to him and whispered, It is for the great ones of our party to grasp the sacredness of the pa. Ponga looked at him closely. Do you mean Puyuhuya? Yes. Did I not see how everyone's eyes flashed and glistened when Puyuhuya was dancing before us, and yours most of all? Friend, you are right. Our leaders have fallen in love with this lady. But if I took her for myself, they would kill me. Master and slave sat for a long time, thinking. At length, the slave whispered again to his master. It was a plan that concerned the highborn girl of Maunga Fo, and Ponga's eyes brightened. The next night, the rangatiras of both tribes sat talking together about the famous deeds of their ancestors. When the fires died down, the old men went off to their own houses, but Ponga remained where he was. When everyone was asleep, he called out to his slave to bring him some water. His voice carried clearly, and the mother of Puhihuia heard the request. Girl, are you deaf? She said to her daughter. Do you not hear the visitor calling to his slave? Go get him some water. The girl replied, With the evil spirits of the night as thick as grass, I would be afraid. But she took a calabash and went outside. Ponga was looking out of the door and saw the girl in the distance. Let me go and find that obstinate slave of mine, for I am faint with thirst, he said, and hurried outside. 
He saw the light of Puhihui's torch and heard her voice as she sang to encourage herself and keep the spirits away. He caught up with her at the spring and said, It is true that I thirst, but the thirst is of the heart. It is inside me, and I bring that thirst to you to be satisfied. Then the two young people knew that they had lost their hearts to each, but that their tribes would not permit them to proclaim their love. Before the sun rose, Ponga sent his slave to Onehunga to cut the lashings of the topsides of the Mongafo canoes, and to launch the Afitu canoes and keep them afloat. When the morning meal was finished, the visitors took their departure. Gifts were exchanged as a sign of peace, and the young people of Mongafo Pa accompanied their friends on the first part of their journey. Puhihuya went with them, but when her father saw her, he shouted, Girl, come back, come back. You are foolish to go too far. Come back, all of you. Her companions turned back at once, but Puihuia started to run, gently at first, but faster and faster as she reached the plain. She caught up with Ponga. They joined hands and ran like feathers driven by the wind, or the wood hen escaped from the snare. The rangateras of Mongafo rushed fiercely after them. Ponga and Puihuia reached the canoes and set off down the harbour. The men of Mongafo were not far behind them, but when they grasped the canoes to launch them, the top pieces broke off and the haulers were hurled in all directions. Seeing that their visitors had made their escape, some of the men of Mongafo stood on the beach and shouted, Go on, go on, but we will follow you. The sun shines, the sun sets, but we remain. The waka in which Paunga and Puhihuia were seated reached the pa at Afitu. When they saw the famous young woman of Maunga Fo, those who had stayed at home came down to the water's edge to greet her, but the steersmen of the waka warned them of the trouble that was coming. Ponga has done us great harm, he said. His heart has been evil towards us. He has stolen the fair one of Maunga Fo, and our relatives will revenge themselves on us. Those who are brave must be brave, for if we are weak, we shall be exterminated like the moor. The chief of Afitu stood up and said, Carry the girl back to her home. I am not willing that the peace between us should be broken for the sake of a foolish boy. Puhihuia leapt to her feet and waved her hand to the people on shore. She took off one of her outer garments and laid it at the feet of Ponga standing before them in her fine white flaxen inner garment, bound with a girdle of kāretu. She rolled this down from her shoulders and girded it round her waist. Stretching out her arms to the people, she said, Look at me. You are wrong to blame Ponga. I came here of my own accord. Yours is the wrong. Look at the excellence of the young man, Ponga. Why did you not keep him in your own place and not let him come to my part? If you had let his friends come without him, I would now be on my own marae. It is you who are to blame. You who allowed the delight of my heart to come to me. Her words melted the frozen heart of the chief and many of his people, and she was taken ashore as an honoured guest. The pipi Firorua has come into our midst, they said. Its song is shine, life. But unless we take care, it will be death that follows. In the discussion that ensued, there were some who gladly received the PP Firoroa of Maunga Fo, but others dreaded the vengeance that would be taken by her tribesmen. They urged that she be sent back, and that Ponga be sacrificed for his presumption. Puhihuia spoke again at the Rangatera's invitation. This wrong is not to be blamed on Ponga. It is your own, for you allowed him to come to my father's pa. Now that you have shown me what he is, I have chosen him for myself. Am I the first woman who has flown to the man of her choice? Although I am a woman, if the towa you are talking about comes here, I will meet it with grimaces of defiance, even if Ponga and I have to meet it alone while you sit silent. What shall I do? Shall I return? Never! Never! I can at least travel with Ponga to the world of the spirits. Before they went to sleep, the men said, The words of our chief are right. The lady is in love with Ponga, 
that as well. Let us help them. Let us be brave. A careful watch was kept, and soon a waka was seen approaching with a full crew. The chief fighting men gathered outside the pa. The waka came close, and the rangatera demanded that Puhihuia should be returned to them. He was answered with defiant words, and Puhihuia told her people that nothing would turn her away from her lover. She bade her people, as they loved her, to come to her wedding feast, but no answer was given, and the waka returned in silence. At Mung Nifo, the discussion was tossed backwards and forwards all night. Some were angry and wished to destroy their friends at Afitu, and to put Ponga and Puihuia to death. It was not until the sky had paled in the light of the early dawn that the oldest Tohunga summed up the feelings of most of the people. Puihuia has bidden us to her marriage feast, he said. Have we taken a dislike to shark's flesh as a relish with our summer kumara? We must send messages to Puhihuia and her friends to say that on the third day after the full moon, we will arrive at Afitu to answer her summons. Puhihuia's mother did not agree. She said to the women of the pa, This is our day. To Afitu! To Afitu! The men are not in this! About 60 women answered her call and arrayed themselves as warriors. They went to Ongehunga, launched their canoes and paddled on until they reached Afitu. The mother of Puhihuia called out to the people of the pa, Grasp your weapons, for we are a war party! The women of Mongnafo had paddled as men, their garments were girded around their waists and they had plumes in their hair. No wonder that the people of Afitu were deceived. Ponga and Puhihuia went to the cliff which overlooked the beach. The young woman recognised her mother and her friends. The paddlers are all women, she said, but it may be that men are lying in the bilge. I will not be taken. I would rather leap from this cliff to my death. Puhihuia's mother called out loudly, Come outside, men of Afitu. Why have you stolen my daughter? What have I taken from you that you should steal the pendant from my breast? Come outside, that we may fight! The people remained silent. It was Puhihuia who took up the challenge. If I am killed, she said, you can take away my body. But if I overcome your champion, you must return to your pa for the tangi. I will not return with you alive. Some of the young women threw aside their outer garments and jumped into the water and swam ashore. They went to the foot of the cliff, while Puhihuia and Ponga descended to meet them. The young man tried to restrain her and attempted to persuade her to run away with him, fearing for her safety. Puhihuia refused. She tucked in her garment round her waist and went forward, holding her taiaha ready. One of the company of girls rose to meet her, holding a whalebone mere. She struck a blow at Puhihuia's head, but it was deftly parried. Puhihuia gave her antagonist a violent blow to the stomach, which put her out of action. Another girl thrust at her with a short spear. Puhihuia leapt to one side and gave her a heavy blow on the shoulder, which made her drop her weapon and retire from the contest. The next girl had a broad-bladed weapon. Her blow was parried, but not so well as the others, for the weapon struck the fringe of Puhihuia's garment. The girl struck again at Puhihuia, but this time the parry was successful, and with the same action, a smart turn of the taiaha brought the tongue of the weapon violently against the girl's stomach. She collapsed and rolled over on the sand. One after another, the girls sprang forward, but each one in turn was disarmed by Puhihuia. At length her mother stood up in the waka and called out, Girl, that is enough! You have defeated my warriors. Let us two now return to my father. She replied scornfully, Will Coupe return? Enough then! Remain here! I will go back and come again at the time of the marriage feast. Hurried preparations were made for the great feast. Fish were netted, fern root was dug and stacked in heaps to dry, sharks were caught and hung on the stages, 
pigeons were speared, peepees were collected, cooked and hung on strings to dry. Koro was cut and stored, the roots of fern trees were steamed in the ovens and power was obtained from the rocks and steamed until they were cooked. On the appointed day, a messenger was sent to Mo no Fo to say that the feast was ready. At last came the day of the great feast. The people of Mo no Fo were entertained with dances and speeches of welcome. The rangateras of Afitu went to a long heap of treasures piled up on the marae. There were huya and albatross feathers, flax garments, ponamu greenstone, and many other prized possessions. These treasures, he said, are for the parents of Puhihuya. When he had finished, the visitors brought their gifts of eel, hapuku, mackerel, dogs, preserved rats, dried peepees, potted kakas and kuakas, and many other foods, and placed them in rows. They added garments, weapons and bread made of hino berries and ropor pollen. When all was ready, Puhihuya's father stood up and touched the gifts with his staff, saying, O oh, all you powers of darkness, all you powers of light, here are your treasures. O oh, you gods and you ancient ones, and you children of Hotunui, here are your treasures. O oh, my daughter, these treasures are for you. You are leaving me, and I grieve for you. Go, go my treasure, but you are not dead. We are descended from the same waka. Farewell. The courage of the young woman who had followed her lover through every danger was then rewarded, and Ponga and Puihuia lived together in peace and happiness at Afitu. <laughs>